Today we're going to talk about participatory economic valuation or, or participatory evaluation of ecosystem services. This talk uh, follows on from uh, week two, the presentation of Stacy Noel. Uh, Stacy identified the main stakeholders uh, involved in these processes and and I'll focus more on, on the participatory uh, evaluation side. The talk will focus on why and where participation is required, how can it be achieved, and what incentives uh, are needed to, uh, to stimulate participation. And at the end, uh, I've listed a bibliography which uh, gives some more detail on, on the examples uh, that I'm going to uh, present. We're going to look at participation in terms of the ELD methodology, the six steps uh, plus one. That's described in the ELD interim report. Um, and I'm going to start with an ex uh, a discussion on why, why should we have participation? Why is it uh, required? Well, the ELD initiative is attempting to estimate total economic value of land. Uh, land has been undervalued for so long and we need to uh, give people a better understanding of exactly how valuable their land is. That includes the economic value of the provisioning services, uh, the crops, the timber, the fuel that can be grown on land, but it's it's uh, much more than just the provisioning services. And it's not only about economics. We need to be able to look at basically three features, in addition uh, to the economics being one, ecological sustainability and, and social fairness must, must also be considered. Now, some of these are very difficult to put economic uh, values on, but in the total economic valuation method, there is an attempt to try and put some of these into economic terms. There will always be some services, such as cultural and aesthetic services, that are invaluable and we can't really put uh, economic values onto them but we need to consider all those values especially from the the perspective of the land user because decision making on land involves much more than the economics but it is affected by economics decision making and also um, economics affects expects the how people view the land and how they decide what to do. It's also very important that we have participation right from the beginning in order to identify exactly what ecosystem services and benefits are important to the people on the ground. Often uh, when these sorts of studies are done, a group of scientists will visit an area and propose what are the major ecosystem services. Um, very often, this is not the same perception as uh, people on the ground. So we need to understand how people view their environment and what ecosystem services are important to them. By doing that, we also can help to identify the indicators to measure the changes in ecosystem services and from there uh, use the indicators in monitoring and assessment uh, to help us develop uh, sustainable uh, land management. So where is participation needed in these sorts of assessments of uh, the economics and the assessments of ecosystem services? And I'm going to use uh, an example from the global mechanism of the, the UNCCD. The, they have a consortium called the Oslo Consortium, which is optimizing soil uh, sustainable land uh, options. 
uh, and they've carried out several studies on valuation using the methodology which we call the six plus one methodology and you can find uh, examples of their work on the global mechanism website so the example i'm going to use is from the tabora region in tanzania uh, this is a part of central western uh, tanzania it's uh, it's a very very big area of something like 7.6 uh, million uh, hectares um, it's used for cropping uh, especially um, tobacco is grown there but there's also a lot of uh, woodlands there and the the oslo team looked at valuation mainly through market prices for things like fuel wood uh, crops timber and, and honey which is also an important uh, product there they uh, focused on participation via focus group discussions that's that is uh, sitting down with communities and village governments to estimate uh, the value of ecosystem services as seen by those communities and local governments the overall uh, valuation of land there came out with some really staggering figures as you can see here uh, just the provision in services were estimated to have a value of 1.5 billion us dollars per year uh, when you add in water regulation biodiversity tourism and carbon sequestration uh, you get very very large numbers uh, in terms of the value of the ecosystem where uh, participation can come into this sort of uh, evaluation on the left hand side of this slide you will see the the six plus one steps of the methodology that ELD is proposing and in orange you will see where I've added uh, where participation uh, can play an important role So I'm using this as a sort of generic example. Uh, the project itself did not do all, all of these steps, all of these participatory steps. Uh, but certainly they started off by uh, the consultations at, at the beginning with, uh, with government officials, with local authorities, regional authorities, with uh, land managers. And that's to get uh, an idea of what information there is available on ecosystem services so it was uh, with consultations and a desk study reviewing existing reports and papers uh, this was then used to determine the land cover using things like uh, geographic information systems and other mapping act activities it looked at the legal and institutional settings in this particular instance the, the issues involve things like deforestation and maintaining rural livelihoods that was important uh, so they looked at land degradation on farms etc and so that first step uh, involved a lot of local people but especially regional and district governments research institutions un agencies town planners land uh, use planning officers etc to get that initial diagnosis and characterization then they went into uh, the assessment of the ecosystem services uh, again they had some focus group discussions to determine which uh, were the important uh, ecosystem services as identified by people then they use basically uh, market value of goods to get at a total economic value and in some cases they had to bring in values from other areas sort of benefit transfer approach and they looked at things like total carbon information and and costing what could also have been uh, done in this work is uh, more effort to identify the ecosystem services in a in a participatory way 
that could have involved things like village walks, encouraging people to use methods like photo voice. Photo voice is a, is a technique where basically local people with some trained people go out into the environment and take photographs with some voice recording uh, if they want to of uh, sites that they see in their environment are very important in terms of ecosystem services. It could be a site of uh, soil erosion, it could be a site of water, polluted water, it could be simply a photograph of cattle grazing on the land or an agroforestry system. Whatever people believe is important to them, and usually they look at it in terms of what are the ecosystem uh, benefits that, uh, that are coming from uh, their environment. And when you do this, working with those communities uh, provides a much better understanding of the complex relationships between ecosystems and human well-being and, and livelihoods. And techniques like the photo voice help people uh, identify, represent, and enhance their community through photos. The photo voice can also help stimulate uh, discussions and if you have local government people involved there then you have a means to affect uh, policy and photographs are very powerful they often remove the shyness uh, that people have from openly saying things uh, in this case there was an issue about a pineapple uh, plantation and people were a bit shy to talk about that, so the photographs were there and they uh, stimulate discussion. And you can uh, identify appropriate indicators at this stage to help monitor uh, ecosystem services uh, and their use. And, and to look at the progress of any future plans that will affect ecosystem services using uh, participatory uh, identified indicators. So that then leads into the, the livelihoods and uh, economic development uh, analysis. You can do this through participatory rural assessments, through discussions and focus groups in, in the study village as this uh, project um, did. That gives you a very clear handle on what are the important ecosystem services, how people value them, um, how people think about uh, them in terms of uh, future scenarios. Then the, the method uh, moves away from participation because then we have to look at land degradation patterns using things like the land cover assessment. We have to go into uh, modeling and scenario buildings. And now technical folk use this information to develop action plans or scenarios to establish improved uh, land management. And various types of modeling can be used, ranging from easily understandable throwaway models that can be worked on with land users. But usually you have to go into more sophisticated models that look at vegetation changes, crop yields, biodiversity, environmental impact, etc. But there's a good experience of, of using fairly simple models, throwaway models, that can be developed on site with people to show uh, what happens, for example, to water supplies if uh, forests are cut down or if uh, a barrier strip is, is removed. Uh, you can develop fairly uh, simple throwaway models that you can develop with the people, with their participation. Uh, but to go into things like uh, scenario building and look at uh, what might happen with different land, land use changes, we usually have to have uh, much more sophisticated modeling. And then in the last step, which is basically uh, the cost, looking at the cost benefit analysis and the sustainable land management options, the plan to do action, then you have to uh, be participative also because you need to build on the knowledge, the information that's been provided through participation and to move towards uh, what might be called negotiated action plans. 
Uh, you can offer people scenarios of what might happen. They can consider what's best for them. And again, they usually think in terms of what are the benefits from the ecosystem services that they obtain for their livelihoods. You can give them options for this. You can show them what might happen. But it's quite important to involve them in deciding what might happen to a patch of ground, whether it remains in forest because it uh, controls water quality or quantity, for example, or whether it can be converted into, into cropland. Um, so that's uh, where participation can fit in the scheme of the methodology that's being proposed for uh, ELD. So to summarize then, uh, where can participation be achieved? Certainly the identification and characterization of the socio-ecological situation and all those ecosystem services, especially the ones important to them. The evaluation of ecosystem services in, in biophysical, social, cultural, and economic terms, that has to be done in an integrated way together. So it's not just focusing on the economic uh, values that can be obtained it's to get that much more in-depth understanding of the complexity and how people interact with their environment and then you go back uh, after you've done some modeling and scenario planning uh, and work through some of that with uh, with the people on the ground so that's uh, a summary of where participation fits within the proposed methodology of the of the ELD. Now, I'd uh, just like to give you some examples of uh, how this has worked, at least in terms of helping to manage ecosystems. And this example shows you the, the multitude of stakeholders that you need to address something like, in this case, it was... Uh, a wetland, a seasonal wetland in, in Syria uh, called the Jabu Agro Ecosystem. This uh, wetland has a lot of competing uses. Uh, when it dries out, there are salt is formed. And you can see from that middle picture, this is people actually harvesting salt from the drying up uh, wetland. But there are fish in, in, the, in the water. There's hunting that goes on. It's a really important source of, uh, of bird migration. Uh, you see thousands and thousands of uh, pink flamingos traveled in there uh, on their en route between uh, Europe and, and Asia. Uh, it's very important in terms of uh, bird conservation. There's industry at the top end that wants to pump waste into the lake. So there's issues there. There's issues over uh, nature conservancy because there's uh, actually an ecotourism lodge on one side of this lake. So there's a multitude of, of uh, stresses and challenges on this particular ecosystem. And so uh, what we did when I, when I worked in Syria uh, was to form a wetland management committee. Uh, this was the first of its kind in, in Syria. And this group of people, uh, under the guidance of uh, a research organization, uh, did things like prioritize topics for urgent attention. They prioritized these in terms of environmental management, uh, the legal enforcement of existing bans, in this case on, on hunting, uh, to fulfill Ramsar obligations, because this is a Ramsar site uh, uh, for birds. And very importantly, in relation to environment and livelihoods, they also designed a poverty reduction strategy in this example. Now, the complexity of this you can see here from the constitution of, the, of this committee. There were 12 government agencies in the top left-hand side, four research organizations on the top right-hand side, two development projects, and that helps facilitate uh, the establishment of these sorts of meetings. And there were 11 civil society representations, including representations of local communities. 
Now, it often takes considerable effort and time to be able to bring this wide array of partners together to work on something like this. And it often takes two or three workshops, uh, workshops with interested parties. We started off uh, in this example bringing together researchers and government policy makers. Uh, we then brought in the, the local communities, the civil society, etc. That takes time. Uh, we had three workshops in effect to get around to deciding what should be the composition of this consultative committee. That time uh, frame is usually beyond the normal frame of a development project of three to five years. So you need some groundwork uh, done there. You need to build trust with those local communities. You need to remove the fear they have of talking to government representatives, for example, at the beginning of the process. All takes time. Uh, and you need certain uh, champions, both from organizations within the government, from research organizations, and from civil society. These are keen, dedicated people that are willing to spend time. And, and these are all often the key, uh, finding those champions that are prepared to see this through. Uh, the second example is a simpler one uh, from China. In China, there are huge issues of uh, degrading grasslands. Uh, they're overgrazed with ruminants, uh, goats and cattle, sheep, etc. They are causing uh, dust storms, of course, in parts of China. This is in the sort of northeast part of, of China. And the idea there was to remove that grazing pressure by introducing chicken rearing on a much smaller area of land. And at the same time, focus on adding value to the animal products, to milk products, to uh, things like yogurts and things like that. The, the idea came from the Chinese Academy of Science, a research uh, institution. They then work with local farmers to start to implement these small scale chicken rearing, what we call free range chicken rearing, uh, and persuading farmers to take off their cattle, reduce their cattle numbers to allow the pastures, the grasslands to recover. That worked very successfully, and one of the key aspects of this was that the project organized an annual national seminar, where again we brought in as many participation, pa participants as possible from local government, local farmers, and what evolved from this was a business sector on, on chick rearing business. So people saw the opportunity there, there from raising chickens and selling them and uh, providing grain, etc., for feed. They then developed this into a very successful business model. And there was a substantial increase in income of the people involved, the farmers involved. Through the national seminars, we were able to raise the profile of this work to a very high level from the national government. The local government uh, has already committed 1.4 million US dollar equivalent and in investment to spread this within uh, the banners, the districts that, uh, that were the initial target. And it's now gone up to uh, a national level with a very large in investment of, of maybe $80 million. And that's been incorporated into what the Chinese called an eco-husbandry uh, project. So we didn't need all the wide range of participants that you saw in the Syrian example. Uh, we just needed uh, relatively few. But that rapidly took off. And through things like the use of uh, mass media, uh, television programs, newspaper articles, national and international, this particular uh, intervention has now taken off. And we're beginning to look at things like the potential for carbon payments, the payments for ecosystem services from this, because when uh, grasslands are generally 80% of the carbon of the biomass is, is underground. So by uh, 
allowing the pastures, the grasslands to recover after grazing, overgrazing, then you can see some carbon sequestration potential in, in uh, above ground, but more importantly in uh, below ground biomass. So this is an, an example that uh, started off with a very simple intervention. Uh, the chickens that are reared there have a premium price in the Beijing market because they are free range, they are relatively they are free of uh, avian bird flu, so you can get a premium price in the market there. So this is a sort of niche uh, uh, market, a niche alternative income that's been associated with this. Uh, it was stimulated by the researchers, but then the farmers and local businesses uh, came into this and have taken it over. And uh, the project will continue to look at the payments for ecosystem services and build up economic uh, numbers on, on the value of those ecosystem services. Now, uh, finally, I'd just like to uh, end up with uh, talking about what might be the incentives that we can offer uh, to get greater participation in, in, in things like the evaluation. The payments for ecosystem services uh, is an obvious one uh, for areas like dry lands. Uh, you look at water quality, water quantity, you look at carbon sequestration, you look at reducing wind e erosion, and you look at preserving biodiversity. These are the four main uh, ecosystem services where we think we can develop payment for ecosystem services. So you need to start off with, with one of them, and usually for, for degraded areas, you might think of bundling those ecosystem services together so uh, you get greater income uh, per hectare, because many of the dry lands, for example, have relatively low amounts of carbon per hectare. For, but because of their vast areas, it can be economically worthwhile. Um, so that's something that's developing. You're aware that at the moment agriculture does not feature strongly in, in the climate change uh, debate, or it's in the debate, but it's not actually uh, implementation of uh, payments for, for agriculture to, uh, to address some of the ecosystem services that agriculture can provide. So a lot more work needs to be done on that. But interest in the results is very important to stimulate interest. Uh, the, there was a lot of interest stimulated in, in the Chinese example, for example, because uh, chicken rearing was new there. You have to try and stimulate uh, that sort of interest in, in new interventions because scaling out is, is always a problem uh, when you bring in a new intervention. So you need uh, economic data to help convince people that this is something that's worthwhile. You have to lower the costs of establishment of interventions because that's a major barrier in terms of uh, increasing sustainable land management practices. So you have to develop up that interest in results. And you can uh, do things at the community level, like setting up competitions uh, within communities and between communities for best sustainable land management practices. You can uh, have small prizes. This uh, stimulates the, the communities to take an interest in new interventions. Farmers are always trying out new things themselves. They need uh, economic data to help them. They need the sort of valuation that uh, ELD can bring. And uh, as many of you are aware, uh, field visits, uh, walking through land with, with uh, land users, uh, that is a great way to stimulate uh, discussions and participation in things like uh, the payments for ecosystem services. These are sort of farmer field schools and that type of thing that uh, are incentives for participation. And the other interesting one is uh, what's termed your uh, para-ecologists. Uh, this was done in uh, a project on biodiversity conservation in, in southern Africa. Uh, and a, a para-ecologist, or they could be called para-economists in, in this case, is um, training local communities uh, as para-ecologists or 
these are ecologists who have not received formal or academic training but are trained on the job uh, and via courses in things like uh, ELD at a very simple level to stimulate interest in the community to uh, offer some sort of reward for people it could be a simple certificate of uh, participation in the course uh, it helps stimulate the continuing uh, monitoring and evaluation of changes that are going on in in the communities uh, it can be guided by uh, academics and uh, researchers uh, it helps to promote ownership of the research results by those communities because if the people themselves are out there monitoring trying to make evaluations uh, then this is uh, much more convincing than hearing it from from outsiders. So these are some of the things that uh, can help stimulate participation and I'm sure many of you already have some examples of this from your work and so I've attempted just to build on what Stacy introduced in terms of the range of participation participants and, and how we might engage them in the process of valuing the, the true value of land in terms of the loss of value when land is de degraded but also much more importantly from the positive side what are the benefits we can get from sustainable land management op options turning it around from this negative rhetoric into a much more positive one and this is the actually the subtitle of the ELD it's a global strategy for sustainable land management because we want to stimulate interest of land users and stimulate interest of, of private sector for example so I think I'll just uh, I leave this presentation here. Um, I've just given you a few uh, references here that you can follow up on that goes into greater detail of um, some of the, the examples that I've given here. And uh, apologies for the lack of a live event. Uh, we had a technical problem here. Uh, between Canada and Germany, which we haven't quite figured out, uh, but we'll be available online to answer your queries and help you get through some of this stuff. So thank you very much for, for listening, and uh, it's goodbye from a still very cold Canada. It was minus four this morning, and we had snow yesterday. Even though it's the middle of April, it's the coldest April day for 70 years, so global warming has a slightly different uh, take in, in Canada at the moment so goodbye for now and uh, hope you'll uh, keep uh, logging in for the following weeks of, of the MOOC.